Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and just a couple quick announcements. This is the last week to get the very cheapest price you're going to get on conference tickets and we have added a couple of conference speakers. Uh, Dick Ablin is coming back, Dr. Richard Ablin, the guy who discovered prostate specific antigen and Jean Stolzer who is a child psychologist from uh, Nebraska. So anyway we're posting stuff all the time on our website at wellnessfarmhealth.com so go there and look at the hot conference interviews and plans and you will not want to miss this weekend with us November 10th through 12th but um, the ticket prices start to go up almost every month so Right now is the time to reserve your spot. Um, second thing, Neil Barnard is going to be in Columbus on June 19th. Don't miss it. He's going to be talking about his new book on cheese. As you probably gathered, it's not promoting eating cheese. It's promoting getting off of cheese, why it's so addictive, addictive why it's hard to quit, and how to do it. And then remember, summer semester starts in about five weeks. Can't even believe I'm saying that. Diet and Lifestyle course is taught by the uh, celebrity instructors like Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Barnard, Dr. Uh, Goldhammer, Dr. Moss. Uh, we only have these people once per year and then the rest of the time it's taught by regular faculty. So very special opportunity to learn from some of the top people in the field and we only do it in the summertime. Pam Popper at MSN.com if you want some information. All right, so issue we're going to talk about today, I'm getting lots of emails about, mainly because it was covered by so much press, and that is the new guidelines re-PSA screening. Um, as I'm going to tell you today, the new guidelines really aren't new guidelines at all. So here's the whole story. Let's just start at the beginning. Well, we won't start at the beginning with the discovery of PSA because there's, that's a longer story, but let's go to 2012. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force in 2012 recommended against PSA testing for men of all ages, stating that the risks of harm outweighed any benefits for any age group. Now, of course, the urologists were screaming and hollering, outraged at um, the USPSTF for making this statement, um, and ever since then, they've been lobbying to have things change. So, on April 11th of this year, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force issued new draft recommendations, which will be open for comment until May 8th. While the new guidelines have been promoting as being very different, a closer look shows that they essentially call for physicians to be honest with their patients and to tell them that risks continue to outweigh benefits in most cases. The new guidelines divide men into two groups by age. So the first age group is men 55 to 69 years of age, and the benefits, of risk, benefits and risks of PSA testing are almost equal in this group. Patients are encouraged to make their decision after discussion with their doctors, and the recommendation carries a C rating, which means that, quote, there is at least a moderate certainty that the net benefit is small. English translation is might be useless to have this or even harmful. Now for men 70 and older, there is greater risk of harm than benefit from PSA testing. Task Force member Alex Kirst, or Christ rather, MD, says that prostate cancer tends to be slow growing in older men. Men are unlikely to die as a result of slow growing tumors and the risks of treatment are greater than the chance of any benefit. Now the guidelines that I just mentioned apply to men who do not have symptoms of prostate cancer, but also to men at both average and high risk, including African American men and men with a family history of uh, prostate cancer. Dr. Chris says that there are no data at this time showing that PSA testing and medical intervention helps men at higher risk. A graphic provided by the task force illustrates the risks and benefits for men aged 55 to 69 who are screened over a period of 10 to 15 years. Um, now here's what it looks like when you translate and follow this through. If a thousand men have a PSA test, 240 will have a positive result and approximately 100 will have a positive biopsy which shows that they have cancer. Between 20% and 59% of these cases will involve cancer that will not grow, spread, or kill the patient. Nonetheless, 80 out of that 100 will choose treatment and 60 of them will have serious complications which include incontinence and impotence. All of this in order that three men out of the original 1,000 avoid metastatic disease and one to two avoid death from prostate cancer. This represents a benefit, listen to this, of 0.001%, very tiny, and 0.002%. It means that the risk of being harmed is at least 30 times higher than the chance of benefiting. 
Studies supporting the proposed new guidelines include longer-term follow-up from the European Randomized Study of Screening for Prostate Cancer, which shows that instead of 0.8 men in 1,000 benefiting from screening, the percentage is actually increased to 1.3 men in 1,000. This represents a whopping one-half of 1% 1 increase in benefit, which means almost nothing to the individual man who is considering having this test. Also, from this same trial, longer follow-up shows that three men out of a thousand will avoid metastatic prostate cancer due to screening, again, back to that 0.0003%. Task Force also cites an increase in choosing active surveillance as first-line treatment as a justification for its proposed guidelines, reporting that 40% of men diagnosed with prostate cancer choose surveillance instead of medical intervention. But that means that 60% of men do not make this choice and are more likely to be harmed than to benefit. The response from the medical profession has been so confusing, it's just hard to fathom. So let me give you an example. Dr. Mark Garnick, who's a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, started out by gushing that the task force was spot on. That's my, his quote. But then he contraindicated himself and said, quote, today, as was the case in 2012, the ability to show an overall survival benefit from any screening recommendations still eludes us, and the cancer-specific survival benefit, if one exists at all, is best at very modest. In other words, the English translation for this is the test is almost useless, and the task force is correct to warn men that the benefit is really small. So, I, I mean, how this is perceived as any real change is beyond me. Now, the urology profession was happy to see that the recommendations against PSA testing have been somewhat relaxed, Recommendations against screening men age 70 and older were not well received at all. The American Neurological Association issued the statement, and, and again, this is just amazing to me, while we acknowledge that there is limited evidence in men in this age group and agree that many older men will not benefit from the test, we believe that selected older healthier men may garner a benefit from prostate cancer screening and should therefore talk to their doctors about the benefits and risks of prostate cancer testing. That's their news in their news release. Now there's a major problem with this advice that everybody's giving. The task force recommends it, the American Neurological Association recommends talking to your doctor. According to a recent study, fewer than one-third of men who receive a PSA test discuss the risks and benefits of testing with their doctors. The study showed that before 2012, when the USPSTF advised against screening for anybody, 30.1% of men had a discussion about risks and benefits, 38.5% were only given information about benefits, and 0.8% were given um, information about risks. So the rest had no discussion at all. So in cases where there was some type of discussion, most of the time it was either no discussion or it was weighted in favor of discussion about benefits. Two years later, things had gotten considerably worse. A, slight, a survey of 111,241 men showed that 29.5% of men engaged in a discussion about risks and benefits, 33.9% had no discussion, 35.7% were given information only about the benefits. While the 2012 guidelines should have resulted in fewer men being tested, this didn't happen because most men were not informed. So prior to the 2012 recommendations, 63% of men had the test, and two, two years later it was 62.4%, essentially no change whatsoever. It's all well and good to advise people to have a discussion, in this case men, with their either family doctors or urologists to have a discussion about PSA testing, but doctors are notorious for not following practice guidelines guidelines for not following the evidence and failing to disclose, disclose all of the information in terms of risks and benefits about tests, drugs, and procedures. The American Neurology Association statement include, includes some very good clues, I think, as to why the task force updated its recommendations in spite of underwhelming evidence. Quote, we also applaud Representative Marsha Blackburn, Representative Bobby Rush, and other leading lawmakers who encouraged USPSTF to adopt a more transparent process that is inclusive of disease experts and other interested stakeholders. Um, in other words, political pressure was brought to bear. Recruiting politicians to get involved in setting guidelines for medical practices is a proven strategy promote, for promoting the interests of drug companies and medical associations. Politicians, and even including some who, that have a medical background, 
really know little about these issues in most cases, and they're easily swayed by things by putting gut-wrenching stories, you know, patients who tell their stories, my dad was diagnosed early with prostate cancer, which may not be true at all, and it's not that these people are lying, they honestly believe that this test that has a 78% false positive rate uh, diagnosed their father with prostate cancer and he's alive today because of the intervention. So these kinds of gut-wrenching consumer stories sway lawmakers, and what happens is they become advocates for for this type of thing, the drug companies, the device makers, the urologists, medical institutions, they end up getting their way. So there should not be politics involved in the setting of medical guidelines and treatment and testing parameters, but that's the way it works. So the bottom line is the data haven't substantially changed since the 2012 recommendations, and the task force is pretty transparent in saying men over 70 don't benefit and men between 55 and 69 should be told very little risk at all or very little uh, chance of benefit, mostly risk. But that's not the way the discussion will happen with urologists. We all know that. So um, it's unfortunate that the task force is bending to the will of politics against the health interests of men, but that always brings me back to the way I end a lot of these broadcasts, which is this is why informed medical decision making is so important because you simply as the consumer must be informed about these issues so that you do not get hurt all right that's all for today for today as usual pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it and this article by the way as always posted in the health briefs library by the time you're watching this video if you're not a subscriber you can um, become one by calling our office i'll be back to you on thursday with more news